Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to uh, our seminar today. Uh, first in the series of Engaging Students Online. My name is Chi Beck. I'm the Deputy Director of the Melbourne CSHE. And um, really my job today is to introduce Tom and this series of seminars. So thanks very much for coming along. It's great to see the interest in this uh, seminar with um, so many of you participating today. But before I um, introduce the session, I'd like to start by first acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we're on, wherever that may be for you. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So well, the topic of this uh, seminar this morning is collaborative learning, something that we know from the educational research can be very beneficial for learning when it works well. And it's also important in terms of graduate capabilities but it's not without challenges, especially in terms of student perceptions and student engagement. And to talk about this today, it's my pleasure to introduce my CSAT colleague, Associate Professor Tom Cochran, um, who's an Associate Professor in Technology Enhanced Learning in Higher Education. Uh, Tom joined us th this year in April from Auckland University of Technology, and he's still in New Zealand at the moment. I'm waiting to be able to come to Melbourne. Tom's uh, research and expertise is in the area of educational technologies, as I said, but particularly mobile learning, designing mixed reality learning environments, self-regulated learning and the scholarship of technology enhanced learning. And this morning, Tom is going to be talking about some frameworks for designing authentic collaborative learning experiences. Tom's also written a short practical guide on this topic that you'll be able to find on our website. So we're hoping there'll be uh, plenty of time for questions at the end but please feel free to write questions in the chat during Tom, Tom's talk, and I'll try to get to as many of these as we can at the end. I should also introduce and thank um, Bronwyn Disseldorf from Learning Environments, who has kindly come along to answer any questions that might come up about Canvas or other university tools to support collaborative learning. So thanks, Tom. Great. Oh, good to see a good number of people here. and. Uh, I'll just go into screen sharing and introduce myself. Right. So as Chia said, the uh, topic for today's webinar is designing authentic online collaboration. And uh, uh, I guess this is a, the topic that, you know, sort of group work and uh, working in teams, although it seems to be quite an ideal, uh, is, is often quite difficult to get buy-in from your students and so I guess today really want to try and have a look at some different ideas have a bit of a conversation uh, try to trigger perhaps some um, thoughts around how to do this so first off I have some notes and there's a QR code link to these notes so if you have a smartphone um, or a device with a camera on it um, you can point at this QR code and it will then recognize it as a web link. This is a Evernote page. So you don't need Evernote app to actually uh, look at this. It'll open a web browser. Uh, and then there's a short code down below. If you don't have a QR code reader, uh, you can just write that down. So it's go.unimelb.edu.au slash C3EJ and all lowercase. So that's just a link to some notes that we'll be looking at today might be useful for you if you want to bookmark that because uh, we'll be linking to several different sources today and jumping around and, and hopefully it'll be a useful resource for you. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to write that down or scan that if you'd like to. Okay, so moving along. About myself, you can find uh, my profile on the CSHE site. I've got a bit of a, a Spark, uh, Adobe Spark introduction, which I won't bother going through today. Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, Tom Cochran, just short for Thomas Cochran, obviously. And um, welcome to follow me on Twitter or send me a message. Uh, I, I do respond to, to Twitter quite well. Um, and I see someone starting to follow me already, which is great. So you have your welcome to country in Australia. I'm actually in New Zealand and working remotely for 
CSHG for Melbourne and uh, probably unlikely to get to Melbourne in the near future as well. Uh, but in New Zealand, we have what's called a pepiha, which is basically an introduction. So this is my pepiha. And uh, this is a Maori. So this is a, basically you associate with geographical features uh, and it gives you a sense of self, of who you are and where you're located. So Mongafuri is the mountain that I associate with. It's close to my home. Waikato is the river. Kaipukiriri is the, uh, the, the, the sailing ship that um, my ancestors arrived in. Uh, Kotorangi, um, Scottish is my ancestry. And uh, Tuakau is my home and Thomas Cochran is my name. So just a, uh, a bit of an introduction to myself. So as Chi said, the, uh, today's webinar is basically based upon uh, a guide that I put together. Um, you can find the link there to the guide. It's on the CSHE site, uh, a guide to designing authentic online collaboration. So uh, a lot of the notes will be sort of linked off that today. And uh, if you want to find out more about some of the resources, you can see them there as well. There is a fair bit of overlap with the subject with another presentation I've done a couple of times for a couple of faculties on hybrid teaching strategies. And we have a Padlet which has a whole range of resources there that might be useful for you. So I have that linked in this presentation as well. I'm not gonna go through this today, but just to point it out to you, um, this may be a useful resource for you. There's lots of different resources that are linked on that Padlet. Some around models and frameworks, um, how to uh, conceptualize teaching and learning, learning around network learning communities, some strategies, asynchronous and synchronous. Uh, how to, some tips around creating practical online type, type of uh, learning strategies. And one of the concepts that I will talk about a fair bit today is designing learner-centric ecologies of resources. So that might be a useful resource for you. So why design online collaboration or, or effectively group work? Well, I think there's two core reasons really. One is it's a, it's a core graduate capability um, for our graduates. It's one of the skills they really need uh, for today and for the future. And the second really is to enhance online engagement. So we're obviously all teaching and learning online uh, in this current time of COVID. And unfortunately, New Zealand has moved back to that. At least Auckland has in full lockdown uh, level three. Um, I'm currently living outside of Auckland, so I get the privilege of still being in level two. So we've got a bit more flexibility, but still online learning and teaching is, you know, very much the way forward at this point. And how can you make that engaging? How can you bring into that environment some of the aspects that we miss from the face-to-face? -face? So that's, part, that's basically two of the reasons. Just to illustrate this, uh, I've got a little video here, which is actually... A, uh, an ad from Hey Sam, would you have any objection to performing a take in your underwear? But at it. Oh. It's beautiful to watch. You're having a good time. You didn't have the socks in the audition. Socks are good. Okay, I'm ready, doing? man. As he's putting the band together, they're going to play from a whole bunch of these Ocean 
So just a bit of a fun illustration, I suppose, of online collaboration. You'll probably um, think of a whole lot of different uh, examples, but that's quite a fun one. And uh, I guess I quite like that one as well, because it's relatively old. So it's, it's not like um, uh, using cutting edge technology of, uh, of today, but that was done um, several years ago. Uh, another example from a project that I was involved in using um, teams right across uh, the globe. So from Columbia, um, Salford in the UK, a uh, couple of universities in New Zealand, uh, Massey University and Unitech, our largest polytech in Strasbourg, uh, creating an international community of students looking at co-creating uh, media resources and videos. And so this was done using an app called Viclone, which unfortunately no longer exists, but it allows you to co-create a video. And people can uh, shoot a video using their smartphones, running the app, and the app then uh, via time stamping and geo stamping uh, puts together a whole lot of clips from the various phones that have been recording and co-creates uh, a mix of a video. So in this case, because we were actually doing this globally, internationally, uh, we used a hashtag, which was a hashtag for the project, hash Moco360. So this is an example of uh, another project. play the whole video it's just a bit of a fun activity for students well that was co-created right across the world using uh, the Viclone app there are newer apps around that will do a similar type of a, a uh, activity the other thing we got um, people to do was actually create a team WordPress site and this was mainly um, from the lecturers but also the participants and in this case, it's just a bit of a record of some of the projects that were involved in this collaboration across the countries. And in particular, this one here, where we've got uh, a student in Salford in the UK using an augmented reality app. And we've got a lecturer here in Bogota in Colombia. And basically, they, they co-created a shared experience where uh, the student in Salford could actually superimpose on his context um, an environment from Bogota and vice versa. So the lecturer in Bogota could actually see in his environment superimposed on his iPad, uh, Salford. So it was quite a fun project. And it gave students a bit of a sense of collaboration beyond their own institution uh, and, and into uh, aspects of sort of, I guess, different cultures as well. So as far as a core attribute goes for our students, we're thinking beyond competence. Now, competence really is a bit of a behavioristic sort of approach. So capability goes beyond that to be able to explore new and un unknown um, areas, to be able to navigate the unknown, to be able to work on new ideas, to be able to problem solve beyond uh, what they've been taught. And I like this quote from Hazen Kenyon. So the second core um, reason for looking at online collaboration is to enhance online engagement. So this is a snapshot from a few years ago using Blackboard and an institution where I was uh, involved with. And you can see in the red or burgundy, this is the elements of the course, the percentage of the course activity that uh, was around content. And then the yellow and the green and the blue are the more interactive collaborative tools that we used 
So things like discussion forums, uh, group work, um, other uh, sort of collaborative tools that are being engaged. And down the bottom is the average of the number of hits or, or page views per student for each of these courses. These are 40 different courses. And uh, you can see that the, from around about 1,000 over the, the length of the course per student average down to, in this case, about 152. And once we went beyond these 40, it basically trailed off exponentially into um, virtually uh, one or two. Um, but you can see the correlation as a little bit of a line here. The more we, the course online is just about content and content delivery, the less interaction there is, the less engagement from students. And this makes sense. You know, if, if the course really is just a dump for PDFs or notes, then you only need to go in there once and download them. So how can we go beyond uh, our courses just being a content dump? So by way of example of that, I've asked Caitlin, Caitlin Gurley, who's actually one of the students on uh, the facilitating online learning course, uh, to give a bit of an overview of her course design and its project that uh, is one of the assignments for the course, but it's a good example of designing and redesigning around sort of these, some of these concepts that I'll talk about a little bit later. So I'm gonna hand over to, to Caitlin. I'll just make you co-host. Okay. Great. No, I can share my screen now, no problem. Alrighty, so thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm a Caitlin Goulet. I'm a part-time teaching specialist from the University uh, from the Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences, um, where I was completing my PhD um, and working part-time. And I just submitted my PhD uh, last month, so now focusing uh, on teaching. Um, and so today I'm going to be sharing with you the proposal for uh, two large online uh, first-year psychology subjects. Um, so these uh, subjects are uh, separate from but equivalent to two core face-to-face -face subjects uh, in first-year psychology. Um, so these are two of the largest subjects at the university and the handbook book links are there. We have up to 2000 student enrollments per semester. Um, so the purpose of these online subjects is, or sorry, the purpose of these, uh, this subject is uh, to introduce students to the major psychology disciplines um, and psychological research methods. Um, and because there is such a big uh, uh, breadth of content, they're really skill focused, uh, meaning that um, they're really set up to uh, prepare students for future studies in psychology and a psychology, uh, potentially a psychology career. Um, but of course, these skills are really transferable to other disciplines and are really applicable to everyday life as well. Um, so the online subjects will be, um, will have the exact same learning objectives and outcomes, but will be achieved in a wholly online environment. And these subjects uh, will be, the subject will be especially uh, designed to do that. Um, so um, I've just admitted someone from the waiting room there. I've got lots of power here. Um, so um, yeah, we actually received a successful learning and teaching initiative to do this. Um, so uh, that means that next year we'll be able to uh, have these subjects roll out online and uh, it'll allow for more flexible involvement from, uh, di from different types of students as well as uh, help to uh, get rid of some of those uh, timetabling and logistical issues we were having with such a large online subject and we're projecting up to a thousand enrollments uh, per semester. Um, so um it will be quite a large online subject so first of all when thinking about uh, an online uh, subject it's really great to reflect on uh, what the learners will bring to the online learning experience or the learner context um, so in our learner context it's incredibly diverse and this is because we have students ranging from you know first year out of uh, out of high school all the way through to graduate students who are returning uh, to study psychology after having different careers I um, mean also first year uh, this sub these subject can be taken as a breadth subject meaning that basically you can have any student from any discipline and any year level um, in your classroom um, so because of this uh, a huge variation um, in uh, student uh, backgrounds, it means that there'll be a huge variation in learner motivations, um, their academic skills, their academic abilities, their technology and online engagement, their social, cultural, uh, geographical and life experiences. Um, and so 
with this very, very diverse cohort, um, they will still all have those uh, Melbourne graduate attributes uh, in common, which we will seek to uh, put forward in this uh, subject. Um, so due to the uh, large amount of diversity in the um, in our student cohort, we really wanted to establish this uh, concept of an online community of inquiry. Um, so this uh, theory is the idea that uh, three, uh, there are three interdependent um, factors that come together to create the student's online educational experience. Um, so this includes uh, social presence, um, which is the student's uh, feeling or identity online um, in the uh, uh, student's yeah, identity online. Um, and also the uh, students' connections and uh, academic connections with their peers, so feeling like they have purposeful and meaning meaningful connections with each other. Uh, cognitive presence can be thought of as uh, like the online learning, how learning is achieved. And in this model, it's really a collaborative uh, process that occurs through discourse between students um, after being presented with different activities and learning problems. And so teaching presence can be considered as the, uh, just the structure and the design of the online subject to allow for a really strong social presence and uh, cognitive presence or online learning. Um, so there's lots of different learning designs out there. Um, and uh, this, uh, this is a review article by uh, Bauer and Vlogtropoulos um, kind of goes through them all. And after reviewing this article, I decided to go with uh, Lorillard's conversational framework. Um, now, uh, this framework offers both a conceptual kind of theoretical background uh, to learning as well as a practical application. And there's this book, or Lorillard's textbook is available on the, uh, as an ebook for the on the Library University website if you're interested in finding out more about this concept. Um, in, uh, just to give you like a very, very quick uh, rundown, the idea is that uh, this this framework is really student-centered. It really requires lots of active engagement and learning. And so it has uh, this idea that um, learners uh, learn through communication or collab uh, communication or um, conversation with their teachers and their peers. And then learners also learn by doing so, modeling the practices of their teachers, producing their own outputs and receiving feedback on those practices. And this can also be modeled um, with their peers. And so again, it's that very learner-centric um, approach to online uh, learning and uh, because it also draws upon uh, lots of uh, it draws upon different learning theories so students will have an opportunity to learn in a variety of ways um, and these are the ways that uh, Laura Lard proposes which is acquisition and inquiry which promotes that uh, teacher communication cycle, uh, discussion promotes the peer communication cycle, practice or activities that promote practice promote this uh, teacher practice cycle, and the collaboration is really that peer modelling cycle. And if you're interested, the learner designer tool, and, I'll, and Tom is very welcome to share these uh, slides with you, um, the learner designer tool, learning designer tool is actually, you can actually create using the conversational framework lesson plans or subject plans um, and to make sure you have a nice mix of different uh, act activities and, and promoting these different uh, learning cycles with your students. So Tom mentioned that he's going to be talking to you more about uh, Lucan's uh, learner centric ecology of resources in a, uh, later on. Um, but basically this stems from uh, uh, the idea or it's like a social or social constructivist learning theory that for people to learn um, extend beyond what they know, um, they need to have the support of more knowledgeable others. So this could be peers, this could be teachers, um, but you can actually also use technology and online tools to extend students um, learning. And so uh, Lucan proposed that there was uh, three aspects of this ecology of resources. So the zone of proximal development is what learners can, uh, the learning outcomes or the potential. Uh, the zone of available assistance is every technology and resource that you can provide for your students in your uh, learning context or in your subject. And proximal adjustment is, is specific uh, resources and technologies that are useful to elicit a particular type of or learning need. Um, so I actually combined these concepts together, the conversational framework and the zone of available and the, uh, the zones of proximal development or the learner centric ecology of resources. Um, and the idea behind this was that when I was selecting, when we were selecting technologies for this subject was to think about what technologies and learning activities will enable teacher communication and what learning technologies and uh, activities will enable peer communication and and teacher and practice model cycle and the peer and um, the peer modeling cycle of collaboration. 
Um, so that led to uh, the development of our ecology of resources, which is basically just uh, all of the, yeah, so basically we have the zone of proximal development here, which is just the learning outcomes for our students, which again is exactly the same as, the, as our face-to-face -face subject. Um, but then when we look at our resources, um, our ecology, we have our zone of available assistance, which is assistance, which is every resource available in our ecology of our online subject. And then I have these proximal adjustment zones, which is these particular tools and online things uh, that can help our students to meet those learning outcomes. Um, and again, we have that very student centered uh, practice here. Um, and so just for the sake of time, because I do have to meet, uh, go visit my students, I'll just take you through just a couple of the activities that we're proposing to kind of make that collaborative uh, experience with teacher and student and student and peers. Um, is the teacher communication, to, so to promote that teacher communication cycle or give our students an opportunity for acquisition and inquiry of information with their teacher. And we're going to replace our online uh, uh, asynchronous uh, lecture recordings with weekly online asynchronous uh, modules. So these modules are going to actually look like um, you can actually create these in Canvas quizzes. And so we're going to talk to uh, refer to them as workbooks for the students, where the Canvas quiz will appear and they'll have a 10 minute micro lecture and readings that are interspersed with quizzes and questions and reflections that they have to answer. Um, and there might be a small uh, a quiz at the end of the workbook that there might be a small grade allocated to for some extrinsic motivation. So, you know, students won't only be learning through that passive acquisition that's associated with lectures, but they'll also be actively uh, engaging with the content and investigating and uh, inquiring. So in terms of the teacher practice modelling cycle, um, this is where the, you know, the student produces a, uh, a piece of work um, and receives feedback from the teacher, which they've modeled, they've modeled their piece of work from the teacher. Um, in the psychology department, we have uh, very lucky to have these, develop these things called the assessment literacy modules. Um, and the assessment literacy modules are where um, we've had a team of expert or experienced tutors grade some papers um, and or grade some essays or psychological lab reports and provide a, a grade and a summative feedback uh, for, sorry, and qualitative feedback for each of the marking criteria. The students are then given these same papers and then they grade the paper and they give qualitative feedback about the paper. And then after submitting it, um, this is actually, they actually see the results of the markers um, or their experienced tutor uh, mark and feedback. And so that kind of creates that cycle between the learner and the teacher in terms of their practices. Um, and so the, the student is able to uh, adapt and, and uh, learn and apply these to their own uh, assignments that they write as well. Um, so for peer communication, and I could not um, express how well this works, is uh, generating that op opportunity for students to discuss and learn together is through our weekly live Zoom practical classes. So Zoom can work really, really well as a classroom. Um, if you think of the main room as being your whole class discussion and then breakout rooms as being your small group discussion. Um, so they work incredibly well, but if you ever do use uh, these practical class, if you ever do use breakout rooms, it's really important to always build in icebreakers because the way that Zoom works, you usually randomly allocate people to breakout rooms. And so having that icebreaker, even if it's just two to five minutes of something easy and fun to discuss, um, can really make those discussions go much, much better um, and can also help to generate that uh, that uh, community of inquiry where students feel like they have an identity and a connection to their peers as well. Um, and of course, you can, uh, in terms of the uh, modelling cycle where students collaborate and produce output together, um, you can also achieve that synchronously on Zoom by getting students to do um, non-graded, you know, activities and produce something together that they, that they present to the class. Um, but we're also going to be using a collaborative blog or wiki. Um, and because of the large size of our cohort, this will probably be take undertaken in Canvas groups so that students are only really interacting with groups within their particular tutorial or practical class, um, just to reduce kind of that burden of having hundreds and hundreds of uh, blogs to engage with and just really help to build that community of inquiry within that practical class. I'm so, so sorry for powering through that and I have to head off to my class now, but I'll stop sharing. Um, and yes, thank you so much for having me. Thank and you, Tom, Caitlin. And please share my uh, slides, Tom. And uh, if you have any questions, please get in touch with me. I'm very, very happy to chat, chat about it more. Awesome. Right. Thank you. All right. Sorry to leave link. you all. Thank yeah. you.
Thanks for your time, Caitlin. All right. Um, so I've, I've put the uh, link into the chat. And I'm just going to go back to uh, screen sharing. <clears throat> um, so Caitlin's presentation is, uh, is available on Adobe Spark. So that's the tool that she was using to present. Um, and uh, effectively, it was an assignment for the facilitating online learning class for the GCAT. Um, but what I, I guess what I really wanted, um, why I wanted Caitlin to, to share how she's gone about implementing some of these concepts that I'm going to talk about now, and we kind of done it back to front because Caitlin had to go, um, was really the idea of scale. Can these concepts be applied at scale? And with uh, Caitlin's class of over a thousand students, she's done a design that, that looks at how this can be scalable using uh, appropriate technologies to create collaboration, communication, and interaction, et cetera. So uh, I thought it was a really good example of that. So some of the key concepts around how do you design collaboration online? Uh, well, there's a lot of theory that we can use to back this up and, and build on the types of activities that we can include. So the one that uh, Caitlin really focused on was the idea of building a community of inquiry. And I guess that's kind of how I structured the, uh, the um, facilitating online learning course as well. So it's structured as a community of inquiry. And so it kind of um, democratizes the experience of teaching and learning where the learners are much more involved in that process as well. And it involves a different approach to the activities, the design of the activities, the design of the uh, assessment. Another concept that is really valuable is communities of practice and perhaps it's a wider uh, concept than a community of inquiry, which still is a bit uh, driven by teacher presence, uh, the community of practice is a little bit wider. Problem-based learning, project learning, uh, ontological pedagogies, and this may not be a term you've heard of before, but I quite like it. It's the idea that we focus on pedagogies and pedagogical strategies that focus on what the student does and the student becoming, the student uh, moving from a learner into uh, an actual role in a profession or uh, you know, where they're going to head in the future rather than just focusing on knowledge acquisition, uh, which a lot of our strategies tend to do. So looking at pedagogies that really focus on the student and what the student does. So that leads us into focusing on creativity, critical thinking, learner-generated content and context. So it's not all just about us uh, delivering content and try to get away from that. And then another concept that you may or may not have heard of is uh, we need to scaffold this as well. We can't throw our students straight in the deep end if they have no experience of online collaboration before. Um, we need to bridge into that, scaffold into that, and this concept of moving from teacher-centric pedagogies to uh, learner-centric to self-directed learning. And it's a continuum that you can move back along. It's not either or. Uh, you can have approaches from all of those and build those into your course. And the idea would perhaps you start in first year, more teacher-centric, teacher second year become more learner-centric, and third year, it's much more uh, student-driven. So I like this diagram, which just uh, was tweeted um, two days ago by um, Stephen Marshall. If I just go up, you can see the source link there on Twitter. Um, and he was just knocking around some ideas of how can we rethink learning and particularly online learning in the 21st century, moving away from very structured online content and assessment and credentialing to creating much more around a community of practice? How can we use our tools to do that uh, and really focus on student portfolios and professional activities and networks and bridging them into that? I thought this was a really nice illustration. So one of the core cool concepts of how to go about doing this is the idea of a college of resources. So this came out of some work by Lucan and her colleagues, uh, 2008, 2010, the idea of uh, mapping to the core graduate out, uh, capabilities, what types of activities and tools can enable those graduate uh, capabilities. Rather than going, this is the, the tool that we have and let's shoehorn what we can do with it uh, to, to you know, meet the learning outcomes that we want. 
move it around the other way and go, what are the outcomes, the learning outcomes we want and what tools are appropriate to get us there? And so create this ecology and ecology is uh, a system that works well together. And so the idea of a variety of tools of learning platforms, et cetera, that work well together. And uh, I guess that's conceptually perhaps why I'm not a big fan of Facebook, for example, because Facebook is its own ecology and doesn't play well with other tools because the whole goal of Facebook is to keep you in Facebook. And perhaps Facebook is a bit of the, uh, the learning management system of the social, social network world, uh, where it's really a one-stop all shop and does a whole lot of things and, and not necessarily very well. So I think a better approach is to grab a tool that does one thing really well and then links to other tools well. So our role becomes more uh, a facilitator of learning communities. And I've got a few examples, a collection of some different contexts um, that you can see as a collection on Twitter. And you can look at those if you're interested in seeing how to apply that concept in different uh, contexts. So one example, this is from uh, contemporary music production, is map out what are the core goals, what are the core graduate outcomes, uh, capabilities that you're trying to achieve. And so it could be um, you're wanting collaboration as a key one, you want to model and teach communication somehow, get your students actually uh, communicating. Uh, in this case, publishing and sharing their work is critical because the, it, it's how they're going to work in, in once they graduate, is um, what are the tools that allow them to publish their work, in this case, SoundCloud, uh, YouTube, Vimeo, um, and putting together a professional portfolio, an e-portfolio, and what tools facilitate this. And so in this particular case, uh, we chose two. One was WordPress, the other was Domain of One's Own, which is a uh, institutionally hosted site that students get their own domain name for. And of course, what enabling technologies, in this case hardware, support that. So a bring your own device approach. And uh, in this case, we were focusing on iPads because that multi-touch environment works brilliantly for uh, an environment such as music, which is all hands-on. And then of course, we need to administer that, we need to mark, we need to uh, have a weekly announcements, et cetera. And so that's where the course hub comes in. And this is perhaps the, the, um, the key place that the learning management system can have. And you can see we used a variety of tools to do that as well. So I guess one of the key things is uh, if you're going to create a collaboration is how do you assess this? You can't just build collaboration with the course and just make it formative and continue to assess in the same way that you have before um, with say an essay and an exam, which is a non-collaborative uh, approach or tool. You need to build uh, collaboration into the assessment process as well and bring that into how do you, um, how do you assess that? What, what are some of the, the strategies? So build it into your formative and summative assessment strategies for the course. Uh, don't just make it uh, optional. Uh, so be explicit about that. So one way to do that is to create marking rubrics so the students know how they're going to be marked on these collaborative activities. And it just so happens that Canvas is brilliant at doing that. You can create fantastic rubrics and in Canvas and assign different uh, categories of what are you expecting for a student to get an A, a B, a C, et cetera. Uh, build into it student participation and maybe some aspects of negotiation. Allow your students to um, have some scope for time frames. Uh, what are some of the options? Maybe have a variety of options and uh, things like learning contracts and perhaps agreements with, with your students as well as another way to do that. Uh, and e-portfolios match with this idea really, really well. One key thing around e-portfolios is don't treat them like an essay. If you do that, it doesn't work. Uh, an e-portfolio gives you fantastic opportunities for formative um, feedback along the way, whether that's peer-based or whether it's uh, lecturer to student. 
you need to build those formative moments into uh, the building of an e-portfolio, not treat it like an essay that gets handed in and only viewed once at the end. I'm quickly running out of time here, but uh, I wanted to point just to a few examples uh, as well. This is um, quite a fun one. This is a collaborative map from a, a group of students. Um, the, we saw the Viclone video that they co-produced earlier in my presentation. Uh, we used a map to give a sense of, of where, of, of the so, social presence I guess geographically of these different groups. And so down the bottom, you've got obviously New Zealand uh, and it was mainly myself and another couple of colleagues that were speaking into the student context in Ireland in this case and the UK. Uh, and, uh, and as you can see, we've got a few participants from Germany, et cetera. And so this was a great way of getting a bit of social presence into this international community. Sometimes when we do collaboration, collaborative activities, they don't always work. So in this case, our Irish students thought it was fantastic fun to actually, because we gave all the students rights to co-create this map, they thought it was a great idea to reposition everyone's points on the map and to put most people into Antarctica. Uh, and <laughs> if you have a look at the map, it's quite interesting to see some of the comments. Uh, this person has renamed this person this point to Bear Grylls. Stranded, please help. Um, so they had a lot of fun with this collaborative map. Thankfully, I'd made a backup and we managed to uh, pull the map back to what it should be. Um, and I guess in some ways they, they kind of stereotyped themselves. Irish students doing an Irish thing. But, uh, you know, that was part of the fun, actually. The, their uh, lecturer was horrendously embarrassed that the students did that. Um, but I thought it was actually quite funny and it was recoverable as well. So, you know, I guess there's gonna be aspects of serendipity when you start uh, negotiating with students and going beyond the comfort zone. Uh, that can be a fantastic learning moment. Hopefully it doesn't go all horribly wrong for you. Another couple of examples um, from a few years ago now, but what I like about this is that these still exist because we use tools that are publicly available and with students' portfolios. So in this case, we call this project iArchitecture, which is about getting students, architecture students, to think beyond the, the physical studio, in this case, face-to-face, -face, and how they could bridge that experience online. And of course, now it's all online. And uh, we got students to create their own teams, and so they, they created teams, and they had to come up with an idea of using augmented reality and virtual reality uh, in the concept of architecture that was relevant to their local context. And so they came up with these two, well, there's more than two, but these are just two examples. So the first one here, Architure. This is a student blog site that they created. We just showed them how to do this and then sent them out, they did it themselves. Um, Tour, if you're not, I don't know if uh, people use Tour in, uh, in, in Australia, but as the students have explained, Tour is Kiwi for thanks or cool. So that's what it was cool. So they basically called this cool architecture. So what they, their, uh, their project was about, a team of about four students, they went out and found architecture uh, around the city they thought was really good and then blogged about it, provided examples of it, uh, did little videos of it, shared it, uh, and then shared that with the rest of the class and with the world. And what's really cool about this is this was 10 years ago, but it still exists. This portfolio still exists online. And then if I just go back to my notes, ignore Flash Player, that's why we should deinstall Flash. Uh, another one where the students decided they wanted to show examples of bad architecture. So they called their, their uh, team Aki Fail. Failed examples of building. And I just like how visual this is. Uh, the students hated some of the buildings around the city. And uh, this one in particular, they said, this building looks like a cheese grater. And as we look at down to it, it kind of does. And that's actually the main police headquarters in Auckland City, uh, the giant cheese grater of the city. So I'm kind of quickly running out of time and she wanted me to leave some time for uh, discussion, but I just wanted to flick through the rest of these notes before we head off. I've got some examples of how I've designed 
the facilitating online learning course and we've used the hashtag which is just the course code uh, educ90970 you can find uh, what we're doing on social media if you have a look on twitter it's all tagged with that hashtag um, we have a course map which basically sort of links to uh, the, the main learning theories that I've used to effectively design this course. Uh, I've got some examples of, of other student presentations, so not just Caitlin's, but in different contexts, and you might associate with some of these. A uh, smaller postgrad uh, psychology course, second year software design, uh, first year architecture, postgraduate uh, health, informatics, um, postgraduate music psychology which is a small class large biostatistics class and teacher education and there's a nice youtube video there as well but uh, just the uh, we've used uh, a, a google map to uh, give a bit of a sense of social presence as well for where students are from and give me a bit of a sense of that uh, but also creating a, a map and a map of how the concepts and map to some of the theory. So this is a great way of kind of basically conceptualizing the design of your course, creating this idea of a map and what are the key elements of your course uh, and how do they map to the concepts and the tools that you're gonna use. So just a, a couple more examples, I've got the examples linked there uh, of the student presentations, of the course designs of how they've decided to apply these types of uh, um, concepts into their own context. And I've got a bit of a summary of some key tips there which we might just bring into the discussion. Um, point you to a couple of things coming up. We are establishing a research network around the scholarship for technology and enhanced learning. If you're interested in taking these ideas a little bit further, uh, we've got a network hub there, a link on the CSHE site. And we're starting a CMOOC around CMOL accreditation, but it's really a professional development activity looking at a lot of these concepts in the domain of, of uh, certifying around uh, learning technology as well. And then some references down the bottom. So I'd better um, throw it open for some discussion and ask questions or else she's probably going to turn me off. I'll just jump out of screen sharing there. No, I wouldn't do that, Tom. Thank you very much. Some great examples there and also thanks to Caitlin, even though she's not here. So we've got about 10 minutes now for your questions or um, comments or other examples you'd like to share. Uh, I can't see a hands raise function on this on this uh, Zoom, but if anyone, please just unmute yourself and uh, go ahead if you've got any questions. Um, Bronwyn, I, 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 I want to throw to you first before the uh, before we open up for other people, and um, just to ask you to for some of the things that Tom was talking about, some of the examples. What are the readily available tools or supports that people can get at the university? Okay, thank you. It um, sparked lots of ideas for me too, and I'm sitting here thinking that we should share a list later to sort of we'll group some of the tools around the particular types of collaboration, whether it's collaborating in meeting or collaborating in um, sharing resources or collaborating in sharing, creating mutual documents or assignments of missions that can be the outcome of a collaboration. Um, so. My ideas are all over the place about the tools. But what I'd like to say is that um, we've grown the suite of tools that are offered with the learning management system and related technologies during this year. We've had such a transformation in practice, people saying, give me another tool, give me another tool. And Learning Environments has tried really hard to make that possible. Um, so there are some options for this semester you didn't have last semester. Um, for example, we have um, perusal as a tool that is being used for collaboration around um, re commenting on documents and having that structured discussion can be an assignment. Um, we've got uh, feedback fruits and I'm a particular fan of at the moment that facilitates peer review, be it peer review of documents or opportunities to interact with documents or to even give feedback about group members and the outcome of the collaboration. Um, so 
I think it'd be better if I just made a list that you can share, Thomas and Chi. Um, with Fantastic. Some, have you noticed? Have you noticed? It's it's quite overwhelming, and and the pace yeah. is is exhilarating. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> but if there's something that you need to support the activities you've designed, please reach out to Learning Environments, and we'll help you select the most appropriate tool. Thank yeah, you. I think Thank that you idea very much. Of More than one the way of doing is, something. Is good. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think, um, you know, theming the tools or um, categorising the tools based on what purpose teachers might have, what objective they might have and what tools might help people to mm. uh, teach in that way. We do have one question about a specific um, use, which is a uh, collaborative space tools for a visual based um, subjects like design teaching or vis visual communication. Do we have anything um, in that area? Well, one, one I w would suggest would be uh, around portfolios for visual is uh, Behance. Mm -hmm. So uh, Behance is now owned by Adobe. And so uh, for students to create a professional portfolio using Behance um, is, is pretty simple. And uh, you know, all the Adobe tools now are supported direct export. So from Photoshop straight into your Behance profile, uh, portfolio, etc. Mm -hmm. And, and any external tool like that, even if it's not strictly integrated with the LMS, you can present links to remind everyone of how to get there. And that idea of um, we are using a suite, but they're integrated in the sense that you've, you've got the LMS as the core saying, and go here for this and go here for this and here for this. Um, we can yeah. help organise it for students. Yeah, I think using the LMS as uh, a hub a linking tool is a, is a great way to mm link out to external um, tools as well. Mm. I'll just put the link to Behance in the chat. Yeah. And also, Tom, what was the app, the app um, that you showed where there was, you know, the ensemble of musicians coming together to, to do that kind of, you know? Uh, we, we used to talk called Viclone, um, oh, Viclone that's right. but yeah. uh, it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Um, but there are other ones like BandLab, um, uh, if you actually have a look at the presentation, one of the student presentations on um, music psychology, they talk about some of the apps that they're using for music collaboration there mm -hmm. and video collaboration. Um, so one, perhaps one other tool that I wanted to point out that um, perhaps people may or may not be aware of, uh, I'll just go into screen sharing again, uh, is Mendeley. So the uh, University, of Mendel oh, University of Melbourne sorry, have uh, institutional license for Mendeley. And Mendeley, if you haven't used Mendeley, is like EndNote. It's a reference manager tool, but it's also more than that. It's, it's a research uh, um, network uh, and collaboration tool. And so you can actually create shared Mendeley groups and libraries. So if you're thinking about mentoring students into research or sharing, say, a shared library of research, uh, Mendeley is one way to do that and you can see I've created a shared group for uh, the course that I'm teaching and um, invited all the students uh, into it and so the members of this shared Mendeley group and they can add to um, the, this reference library you could you know assess it by having people comment and annotate on resources like etc comment um, add the PDFs to them uh, and so it becomes a co-created reference library, which, which is a great tool. So that's one that's um, University of Melbourne actually pays the license for, allows us to have groups of up to 100 participants and up to 100 gigabytes of data.